Okay, cool. Um, well, thank you for inviting me to be on this Google Hangout. It's awesome to be here this morning. First, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. You know, I'm a journalist who's been working in journalism, traveling the world and around the United States for almost 20 years now. But I grew up in a a suburb outside of Sacramento, California, and it was a pretty um, all-American, non-diverse, very cookie-cutter town. So let's just say there weren't many kids in my school or my neighborhood that looked like me or my sister Lisa. There were very few Asians, maybe five, um, maybe two Latinos, maybe two African Americans. And so I just felt kind of different and uncomfortable in my own skin. And then for college, I went to UCLA, and you all know what that stands for, right? The University of Caucasians Lost Amongst Asians. <laughs> now they know. Right? And um, so it was, it was this eye-opening experience because being at UCLA it was so diverse. And my three closest friends during my freshman year in college one was a young gay man who hadn't come out to his family yet. Another was a deeply Christian, conservative and Christian girl. And another was a young Latino man who was the first in his family to go to college. He was a dreamer. And these were my three closest friends. And they were so different. And they all had such incredible stories to share. And I think that's one of the reasons why I decided to pursue journalism. It's because I wanted to immerse myself in different cultures and situations to share those stories with others. And so over the years, I've been able to travel around the world and cover stories ranging from slavery in the Amazon in Brazil to the humanitarian crisis in Haiti. Um, to activism and the fight for greater rights here in the United States. And so many of the people that I have met have really moved and inspired me and have changed my perspective on the world. When it comes to North Korea, um, the story that I was working on along the Chinese-North Korean border was about people who are fleeing from North Korea North Korea is considered to have one of the harshest governments in the world. So people are denied very basic rights. Um, and people are very hungry. And so many people are being trafficked or smuggled across that border into neighboring China. And the majority of people who are being trafficked are women. But they find themselves, once they're in China, they find themselves in very desperate conditions. Um, some are sold into marriages. <laughs> others are lured into the prostitution industry. And so it's a, very, um, it's a very hard life that these North Korean defectors, is what they're called, referred to as, um, they, they face a very difficult future. While I was filming along that border between China and North Korea, it was, it was in March, and there's a river that separates the two countries. And the river was frozen. And so I was with my team, and we stepped foot onto that frozen river to show people how people are smuggled across that ice. We were there with a guide that we hired in China, and he motioned for us to follow him until we were on the other side of that river. And we got a few shots, and then we turned around and went back. And it was on that ice, when I turned around and I saw two North Korean soldiers, they had their guns, their rifles raised up, and they were running toward us. And so we just ran for our lives. And I've never been more afraid. They chased us into China. 
and they were able to apprehend one of my colleagues, her name's Yuna, and me, and we tried whatever we could do to stay in China, but they were determined to take us into North Korea, and so the soldier that was dragging me, um, he was pretty violent with me, let's just say. Um, I was knocked unconscious and then taken into North Korea. And it, with, that is where I spent the next five months in captivity. Um, some of you may or may not be aware that eventually um, President Bill Clinton and his team flew to North Korea to serve as an envoy to help our police. And I returned back with President Clinton and his team. And you know, a lot of people ask me, what happened on that river? All I can say was that I relied on my instinct and I followed our God across the other side. And that was the wrong decision. My instincts failed me. And there will be times in your lives when you also make those wrong decisions where you might rely on your instincts and they may not be the right choice to make. And you'll have to live with those decisions. And that's something that I have to do. I knew that I could not sit around while I was in captivity and just wait for someone to decide my fate. I had to take control of my situation. So I tried to meditate and exercise to keep my energy up. And I tried to engage my captors, um, try to figure out what would get us home. I know we don't have a lot of time here, so I will I will just mention one other moment during my captivity, and that is the relationship that I developed with some of my guards. These were women from North Korea that were very mean to me when I first met them. They were very intimidating because they saw me as their enemy, and I was very apprehensive about them. But we were able to break down some of those barriers and those preconceived notions that we had about each other. And there were moments of compassion that I will always be grateful for. One guard, actually there was one moment when one guard, she had a piece of candy and she gave it to me and she said, don't tell anyone else I gave this to you. And so she left and in walked another guard and the guard, this other guard didn't speak English, but she motioned for me over. She opened this drawer, she pulled out a piece of candy, and she said, shh, don't tell anyone, right? And it was those little moments that we would share that, to me, it was a lesson in how we treat other people. And if we only take the time to engage with those we consider different, we might find out how much we actually have in common. So I think right now, now more than ever, we really need to start breaking down those, those bridges and barriers and develop a common humanity and understanding for each other and really embrace what makes us so different and unique. Um, so Christine, I know that you, you have very limited time here. Should I open it up for Q&A? continue chatting, whatever, whatever you guys want to do. Sure. I think um, let's open it up for questions if anyone has questions for for Laura. All right, Chris. Uh, would you ever go back to the border of either North Korea and South Korea or North Korea and China to film? Would you ever go back to, would I, a, would you ever go would back I ever to the go border? Back? Uh -huh. You know, I, given, um, I mean, sure, the border between North and South Korea is one of the most heavily fortified borders in the world. Um, and so, you know, tensions are very high right now, as many of you may be aware of, but it's relatively safe. You know, tourists will go there um, to see the border. The border between China and North Korea is actually very poor. So there's no fence. There's no, there are no signs. There's nothing 
that really it separates the two, and that's why they have a surviving black market where goods and people and information pass through. But given the history, uh, the recent history of um, people being apprehended in North Korea or along that border, um, I would not go back. In. I would not go back. All right. Thank you. Uh, Rosie has a question back Thank there. Thank you. And then Sonia. What gave you hope that you would eventually be released? Sorry, can you repeat that? What gave you hope that you would eventually be released? Well, you know, I there were plenty of times when I felt like I was about to give up hope. Um, and there were times, you know, it was such a frightening situation that getting through five minutes felt like an hour. Getting through a day felt like weeks. And eventually, you know, I, I tried to develop the strength to get me through another hour, another day, another week. And eventually I began to maintain hope. And, and that's why, you know, Christine showed you that video earlier. That's one of the things that I did was to practice that act of gratitude because that helped me to carry on hope that I would eventually be released. And and in that video I mentioned that something I do to this day, so every night before I go to sleep, I will think about something that happened in that particular day that I felt grateful for. And it helps me to stay grounded and it's something that I'll do tonight and I think that I will think about being, speaking with all of you and being able to spend this morning with all of you. And that's what I'm going to go to sleep feeling grateful for. And it might be a ritual that you guys want to try as well. Sonia? Hi. Um, I'm glad that I'm so happy that you're home and that you're grateful <laughs> and, and, and still have all that hope. Um, my question is, how is the sorry about going back to it. How is the torture towards you and the other females and how was it uh, like hygienically? Um, basically. The, the situation, what was the... Were, were you tortured and was it, how hygienic was it? <laughs> um, I, love, I love that question because I'm, I'm a total germaphobe. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, aside from the actual capture being very violent. Um, when they actually had us, we were treated humanely. And I think that once we became um, prisoners in North Korea, we became pawns in a larger political game. And so they were very careful to want to make sure that we were not harmed because immediately we had become bargaining chefs, right? There were threats uh, made to me. Um, you know, at one point, one of my interrogators, said, if I didn't, if I wasn't totally honest, then, you know, that would be it. And for me, that's sort of all it, all I needed because because I was treated so, because I was beaten so badly when they captured me, I thought that anything was possible. The conditions were basic. Um, I felt lucky that I got three meals a day, even though the portions were very small, because, you know, the people of North Korea themselves are experiencing a very dire situation where I thought I was probably getting more food than they, the average person in North Korea gets. So I consider myself lucky. You know, I didn't shower for months, um, and it wasn't easy. The It was extremely cold. There was no heat in the winter. And so, you know, it was cold. I didn't have access to a shower. I had to make do um, with the little things that I had. But once I was in that situation, the, the condition sort of um, took second place 
to my, what was on my mind was the strategizing and how I could get out. At one point I was held in a very dark jail cell. It was probably five feet, five feet by six feet, pitch black. Um, that was very scary. And I didn't know if I would be able to endure those conditions. Um, but then I was moved and the conditions improved to just being, you know, very basic, but livable. Maybe one or two more questions. Anyone have a... Yeah, Matthew? How was the food? How was the food? <laughs> <laughs> what, what That's the always one of the first questions. <laughs> um, that, the food was, like I said, it was very basic. So it was a small bowl of rice, maybe a small piece of fish, and maybe, or maybe, you know, like a small plate of vegetables. So, you know, very, very basic, awful, but it, you know, I was grateful to grateful to have it. Maybe that, like a boiled egg. Did did she meet the president? Oh, which president? <laughs> oh. Did you meet the North Korean dictator? I did not meet um, the North Korean president at the time. It was the current leader's father. So. The leader at the time was Kim Jong Il, who everybody in the country their leader. And my guards, they would talk about him as if he were this this otherworldly, almost godlike figure. So there was a lot of people would express a lot of reverence for their dear leader. The current leader is his son, Kim Jong Un. Um, and, but no, I didn't meet the leader. I did request to meet him, and if that would help my situation, but I never met with him. President Clinton, however, did meet with him, and, um, and that, so, so he met with Kim Jong-il. <laughs> and I'll tell you a story about that meeting. So, on the plane ride home, Kim Jong, or President Clinton, told me that when he met with Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-il said that when Kim Jong-il's father, Kim Il-sung, who is the founder of North Korea, when Kim Il-sung passed away, when his dad passed away, President Clinton was the first leader to call Kim Jong-il to offer his condolences, even before Kim's own allies and friends and so he told Clinton that he always remembered that kind of gesture and had wanted to meet him ever since. And so it's kind of crazy to think that our release might be based upon that phone call that happened so many years prior between Clinton and Kim Jong-il. And that because Clinton picked up the phone to call his, you know, quote unquote enemy, or the leader of this enemy nation, that that meeting was taking place. And I think it is also a lesson in diplomacy and mutual civility. We may not like each other, we may not respect each other, but there can be civility in our conversations with one another, and it can be a first step to getting somewhere in diplomacy. Amen. Yes. Um, in our community, we we don't know very much about North Korea. We're not paying attention to it. So, what would you want us to know about North Korea? Okay. So, uh, Miss Rossi is asking, what would you want us to know about North Korea, since many of us don't know that much about? Yeah. Well, we we hear a lot of we hear a lot of very hateful words and and hateful rhetoric that is kind of thrown between our two governments. But I think what gets lost in the mix of these things is are the, the common people in North Korea, the people who have to live their everyday lives in a very harsh system. And, and like I said, the situation between me and my guards, we were both very skeptical 
people of each other. But at the end of the day, we all want the same things, right? We all want a better life, a chance at a better life. We all want safety and security for our families. And so I would say that, you know, while our governments might talk to each other in a certain way, it's really important to remember the people and the innocent lives that are really at stake. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for dropping your kids off real fast so you could come talk to us. I guess you can't really stick around <laughs> for questions, but um, yeah. She was saying something? Oh, I just said thank you. I'm grateful to have been able to spend this morning with you. All right. Thank you so much. Let's give her a hand. All right. See you at the cousins' party later. Oh, that's